Okay, welcome back everybody. We're going to get started for our last session this afternoon. Um, before we do that, I do have a, a few announcements. Uh, first, when it comes to the um, surveys, we have two surveys you're going to be receiving. One is a survey, an email survey immediately after the training, and that's about this training. And then you're going to have your CME survey. That's the second survey. Please remember um, to fill out both of those. Uh, we have an overall certificate of completion. If you want a certificate of a completion, please see the um, please see the contract staff at the registration desk. Tomorrow morning, you don't come here. You report directly to your uh, workshop rooms. And you all see where those are. There have been some changes also in terms of location. So please double check on the board before you leave. Um, yes. Finally, uh, I have to do our thank yous. And we have so many people to thank. Um, for getting this program really accomplished. Um, believe it or not, it's uh, over a year in the making. We're already planning our next years. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes into that. And um, with that, uh, I want to thank our um, staff here from the um, center. Uh, we have uh, Barbara and Garrett. Please raise your hands. They have done such a great job for us. Thank you, Barbara and Garrett been very responsive to whatever we needed and uh, I'm trying to bring them to DC for uh, the things that we do there so but anyway they have been fantastic and then we have Sergeant Rosario Sergeant Rosario has been amazing from the day I came to do a site visit over a year ago uh, really been helping with everything Sergeant Rosario is from the uh, clinic and uh, has really been a right hand person and uh, it, we have our IT people, and we want to thank our DIVIDS people uh, for our live broadcasts, our DIVIDS people, and our IT people from here. Our IT people here have done a fantastic job, too. And um, last but not least, I have to thank Amy. Amy, who does like everything for everything for everybody. And now, this is like for an example, and this is like a metaphor. At 5 o'clock this morning, I get up, I get ready, I'm getting my thing, and for some reason, my glasses got knocked off of my table. I couldn't see a thing. I give a panic text to Amy at 5 in the morning, come to my room immediately. Now, if that isn't a little bit kind of like creepy, you don't want to, you don't want ever to have your boss doing that. And for bosses, don't do that. But um, if you say, oh, are you OK? And I'm, it was a great commercial like for LASIK, because I would have had to have been like, led around by the hand all the way. I wouldn't have been able to do this. But a big thank you. Those are the things that Amy does. And a big thank you to Amy. Thank you all. Yay. All right. So we have one more talk today. And um, we're very, very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Hunter, um, Dr. Chris Hunter, uh, uh, Navy Captain, Public Health. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Public health captain uh, and Dr. Hunter graduated University from Memphis, PhD in clinical psychology, uh, board certified in clinical health psychology, 10 years in the Air Force as an active duty psychologist. Uh, currently works Defense Health Agency, Medical Affairs, and is really leading up our efforts for primary care behavioral health services. And again, I said, Chris, we really need to hear from the person who's really making these policies and doing this. And Chris was like, absolutely, Chris, Chris to Chris, and said, absolutely, and uh, came all the way to uh, tell us a little bit about the DHA uh, procedural health instruction. So we're going to change our, um, our slides to that. And we will get going. And that will be our last slide uh, deck on the. Excellent. Yep, that one. Um, and we'll double click on that bottom. Perfect. Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for that introduction. Um, 
I realized the context when I got here today that I'm the DHA guy <laughs> coming to talk about policy at a skills building conference directly after lunch and on the last thing in your way for freedom for the rest of the day. So I realize that context as we're going to go through this. And so hopefully we'll have a, a little bit of fun and uh, you'll walk away with a, a little bit of knowledge as well. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Nothing to disclose. So we're going to talk about uh, a couple different things. We're going to talk about, one, what were some of the, the main um, forces that led us to come to this procedural instruction? What are some of the key concepts that are in it? What are a few of the measures that we're looking at to see? Are we succeeding in what, what we're doing across a range of services? Uh, and a little bit on the primary care implementation of the step care model. Um, is there anybody in here who's read this instruction by hand, a couple? How many of you remember what's in it? <laughs> couple, OK. Um, so we're going to do a bit of a high level overview. Um, if you want to know the particulars of the instruction, you can certainly download that and, and read those before you go to bed if you want to do that. And it may be facilitate other habits that you might want to engage in. Uh, the procedural instruction is actually being rewritten right now. There were some things that were a little fuzzy and people had questions on that. Um, just also by raise of hands, did anybody have a part in writing this instruction? Anybody get a chance to review it? Because it went out to lots of people for review. And, and just for clarification, while I do work at the DHA and I did review one of the, you know, some of the drafts of this, I was not a primary writer on this. There were a lot of people who had input on this. So it really took a, um, a group effort. So what really drove this was there were a number of publications, policies, starting with the National Defense Authorization Act in 2010, and you've got a list of the others there that were really showing that we really have the opportunity to do a lot better job in terms of how we're doing with both screening, assessment, intervention, and treatment for folks that have acute and chronic pain. And that really, in some areas, we're, we're, we're really kind of doing a poor job, and, and we need to make sure we do a better, from um, adding in evidence-based, evidence-informed, uh, non-pharmacological interventions, as well as doing better with pharmacological interventions that, that we were, uh, uh, that are available to us. Next slide. So the primary goal of, of this policy, and the way I like to think about policy is policy is necessary, but it's not sufficient in order to make change actually happen. But the policy really sets a standard or a benchmark that people can always go to. Now, if there's nothing out there to help implement that policy, there's no support, there's no change. And I know, as you have all seen, here's the policy, here's a PowerPoint presentation, go out and do it. Oh, we're not going to give you any feedback till you really screw up. Has anybody experienced that in there? You don't have to raise your hand. Um, so part of the goal was to how can we take the best evidence that's out there in our clinical practice guidelines how can we incorporate that into a policy that really sets some minimum standards or benchmarks that promote non-pharmacological evidence-based interventions and allow us to prescribe in a way that decreases risk and can be most effective? Next slide. Just by show of hands, how many people have seen this diagram, this model, step care model? And I suspect that some of you, before this policy were, even came out, you knew about the step care model. You may have been even effectively doing it at, at your base. Part of what we hope is that not only with I, my primary lane is primary care, but also with specialty that we're going to be able, from a DHA level, really be able to support you in making this happen, not only from electronic health record changes and discrete data polls and feedback, um, but being able to, no kidding, you know, boots on the ground, what are you guys experiencing? Um, are there any primary care pain champions in here, just by show of hands? Some of you are in the cohorts, I know, because I recognize some of you who have already started this. We've already 
taken feedback from those cohorts who are implementing this in primary care and have already made changes in the way that we're training it and our electronic health record. But, you know, with the step care model, our goal is to, you know, on the, the primary care side and the self-management side, how can we reach further down there? How can we make it as easy as possible for patients to do self-care? How can we really maximize what happens in primary care in the patient-centered medical home and the entire team so not only are we catching acute pain and treating that effectively and hoping to keep that from moving into a chronic pain condition, but how are we using a host of different professionals at the primary care level to manage chronic pain as well? And then how are we using that team to step it up to a tertiary level of care when that's really the most appropriate for that patient or they're not responding? And then sort of thinking about long term, am I the only one hearing cool music out there? Okay, thought maybe it's just me for a second, long flight. And at that tertiary level, when they don't need that level of service anymore, how can we make sure that we move that down? And the pointer I have, I'm assuming it's still not going to work. Yeah, this is the invisible slide. You can see it, I mean pointer, see it down here, but then when it goes up, boop, it disappears. So you've got the patient is right here in the middle. And so keeping in mind this is a patient-centered approach, it doesn't mean that the patient gets everything they want, but how can we work collaboratively along this continuum to provide the right care at the right time? Next slide. There are a number of key concepts that the policy is pushing. One, and I think you all are, should be familiar with this, is the DVPRS being pushed out and being the measure of, that's in the procedural instruction. So this is the measure you should be using a focus on functional and qualitative outcome or impact, not just what is your pain rating today and trying to move that uh, rating down. Um, focusing on non-medication interventions at that early level and or at a tertiary level. Um, so thinking about involving physical therapy, yoga, mindfulness, cognitive behavioral interventions, massage, having a host of tools or registries where we can give people transparent information about what their prescribing practices are, um, where we can have them uh, be proactive before they're seeing patients and, and have the data right at their fingertips so that they can have those discussions with patients and make decisions about what is truly going to be the best care for that patient given what they're willing to take on at that particular point in time. Next slide. Here are some of the key measures that we are looking at. And though, so these are getting reported on pretty much a monthly basis to, um, to Dr. Kortz, who's the senior executive staff lead at Medical Affairs. And so, hey, no kidding, we're really looking at this. And we're really looking at things to change or be different. Now, if they don't, well, we want to kind of look at what's happening. Is that getting washed out in average? Are certain clinics doing better than other clinics, but not for it to be a punitive thing, for it to be an informative thing. Um, so we're really looking at how can we decrease the frequency uh, or, or, or the duration of certain kinds of treatments, how can we reduce the, um, the level of those treatments, how can we look at other polypharm and how that might be with benzos and how that might be increasing risk um, and looking at for folks that might particularly need it, how do we make sure that we have a safety net for those folks who are on long-term therapy. That's not the only stuff that we're looking at. Yeah, go to the next slide. So, you know, here's just an example of some of the key measures and what we're trying to move up and down. Um, we're also getting assigned primary care pain champions, so they're going to be the primary folks um, training the implementation of the step care model in their, their clinics. Um, there are other implementation measures that we're looking at, but I didn't want to overwhelm you again. This is a skills building conference, not a, oh my gosh, please don't show me any more metrics kind of conference. Um, <laughs> go ahead and go to the next slide. So kind of within all of that, I knew from my, the, my 10 years in the Air Force and now my 11 years in the job I'm in and the iterations of this job, 
that if we didn't put together the implementation support for this, it was going to crash and burn. I knew it was. And so I had the opportunity to be the primary care clinical community interim chair back in 2017. And so one of the things I pushed is how can we make sure that we provide primary care, because that is my swim lane, the support they need to implement this model? Because we know that clinical practice guidelines are great, right? It gives you all the best science of what you're supposed to do, what kind of outcomes you might get with that, what are the risks for doing different kinds of things. And we also know that just because the CPG is there, after you've read through the 35 pages of wire diagrams, that you don't necessarily remember what you need to do or when or for how long. And complexity does matter. So part of, at least the way that I look at it, DHA in my role, part of my job is at least in primary care and when I can influence other things, is how can we make it as easy as possible for you to clinically engage with that patient, not have your EHR overwhelm you, either because it's got the spiral of death going, and we won't talk about MHS Genesis because I'm afraid of what might happen in this room for those of you. Anybody on MHS Genesis right now? A couple of you. I know there have been big leaps and bounds and improvements, and ultimately it's going to be, I think, a really cool thing. We've got two thumbs down. Two thumbs down. Okay. You can stop crying now. It's okay. Um, but complexity matters. And so we, want, we wanted to make it as easy for primary care teams to be able to implement this. So next slide. Um, we spent over a year bringing in a multitude of subject matter experts to create what are we going to do. And that just didn't include folks from DHA or folks at the higher service levels. We brought people in who were actually in the clinic. We ran everything through your PCMH service lead, uh, got their approval and everything. So we spent over a year creating how is this going to look, what are the trainings going to be like, how are we going to fund the trainings, and that went through a lot of different iterations. Um, how are we going to pull data? Because we need to know if what we're doing is having an impact. And that data includes both implementation data. Are you doing what you're supposed to do in the pathway, yes or no? Are you doing it right, yes or no, or maybe? And then if you have those things, what kind of outcomes are you getting? So it was important for us to modify the EHR so that it was consistent with what the pathway is and agreed upon, knowing that we're going to get it wrong at the beginning and we're going to need to change it. No matter if we spent three years on it, we're still going to get part of it wrong because we've got to test it out. Um, so there was a lot of time and effort. Um, I suspect, although this isn't my lane, that a similar effort is going to happen in the near future with tertiary care because basically what we want is for any patient who goes to any clinic for direct care in the MHS that has the same kinds of services, for that to look pretty much the same. We want to have a baseline of standardization, and you only have variance when that variance is warranted based on the unique presentations or circumstances of, of that, that patient. Next slide. So I'm going to go ahead and read this because I think clinical pathways and clinical practice guidelines get confused all the time. So let me go ahead and read this. A clinical pathway is a documented sequence of clinical interventions placed in an appropriate time frame, written and agreed to by a multidisciplinary team. They help a patient with a specific condition or a diagnosis move progressively through a clinical experience to desired outcome. So it's not one individual provider doing their own individual thing based on what's in the CPGs that they want to focus on. Now, the clinical practice guideline recommendations are part of what's in that pathway, but it's a no kidding, whole team kind of, here's the pathway we're rolling out. Here's how the electronic health records changed. Here are the kinds of services that we expect. Here are the kinds of outcomes. When you see patient X that has this, you might want to bring the PharmD in. You might want to bring your IVHC in. You might want to bring PT in. This patient looks like they really need to go to tertiary care because they've got all of these factors going on. And trying to make it as easy as possible, like we said, we've, um, and for some of you cohorts out there, we've, uh, we've changed some of the 
the training. We think it's better. We've changed some of the EHR. We're still working on that. I think we're close to being able to launch um, a parallel process in Genesis. So I've been, I've been, t we've been working on that for a while. So um, next slide. So ultimately, what we wanted this pathway to do was to allow the whole team to understand what are the whole constellation of variables that impact acute and chronic pain and people that maybe move from an acute to chronic pain state. How do you think about screening uh, in a consistent team way that has a biopsychosocial approach and so, so can look at where are some of those targets that we might bring in those non-pharmacological logical interventions. Um, how do you work with the patient to have their self-management goals? So asking them what's important to them, providing um, educational materials for the team to use. Uh, how can the team, if they're going to prescribe opioids, prescribe them in a way that mitigates or minimizes that risk? And so um, there's a variety of different trainings. Go to the next slide. Um, the, the primary care pain champions have a, um, have webinar trainings. They also have an eight hour face to face training. And I think that's really important because they are, get a chance to ask all kinds of questions, um, get to talk with their, uh, counterparts and they get a chance to practice teaching this because they're going to be responsible for making it happen in, in their clinic. Um, the internal behavioral health consultants. They get eight hours worth of webinar with expert trainers that listen into their skills building. So we have breakouts in that webinar. Um, we've changed the IBHCs, tri-service workflow forms as well, so we can pull data on all of their patients. Um, we are trying, we trying, we are providing support with follow-up phone calls. We're going to be giving data back to the primary care pain champions on, hey, here's what the variables look for your clinic. Here are the things that it looks like you're doing well on. Here's some things that you might want to look at and target one of those to improve over the next three months. So it's an ongoing process. And this is, um, uh, this isn't going to go away. I mean, it's the, the data on this stuff is going to get reported to Dr. Quartz on a regular basis. It's going to end up in reports to Congress. Um, and our goal, like I said, is to make it as easy as possible for folks to do this. And we're going to want to hear feedback from the field. What's working? What's not working? How can we change that? Next slide. As promised, even faster than you thought, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I am completely open to questions. That was sort of a fast overview of what the policy was geared towards. We didn't do a deep dive. We could have spent more time on those slides. But again, this is a skills building conference. And one of those skills is to know, you know what the policy is and what the targets are. Yes, we have a question over here. Yes, thanks, sir, for the talk. Um, the purpose of the step model of care is to get the right patient to the right care at the right time. So um, just from the field, what we're seeing, I'm wondering, I guess my question, and doing a kind of a long talk about it before I, I'll get to the question first. Um, what is being done and developed to have other things available, such as TRICARE paying for acupuncture, TRICARE paying for chiropractic, et cetera? Because it's great to have this training in eight hours, and this is how you do the step model of care. But in the field, what's happening is the providers know at, at the medical home this patient does not need opioids. They need functional rehabilitation. And so the step model of care is you're a chronic pain patient, go to the IPMC. It's still doing that's still the model of care we have. Because there aren't because we have the resources at the IPMCs to provide some of that. So we're providing basic education that should be done in the PCMH. Um, so I was just wondering if, if there's any other resources going into starting programs where the patients get that patient basic education and counseling and then movement therapies, et cetera, as opposed to you have this at the tertiary care level, even though because we have the resources. So I, I, that's an excellent question. Let me see if I, I can answer. And if I miss it, r r let me know how I've missed it, and I'll try again. Um, I, th I think for what we've done in primary care is um, we, have, we have created educational materials for pain exit handouts that talk about 
what are the cognitive and behavioral things that can be done in primary care. We've created educational trifolds. Every primary care clinic that has at least 3,000 adult enrollees is mandated by DOD instruction to have one full-time IBHC as part of that team. They've been trained specifically with a standardized, modulized manual on how to do behavioral interventions for chronic pain and acute pain. So that's part of it. I think the other part goes to what about clinics that don't have PharmDs? What about clinics or MTFs that don't have PT? In terms of some of the other things that you talked about, acupuncture, some of that comes down to money. I think it varies amongst the services about and larger MTFs tend to have more resources. They tend to have more there. And so part of what I hope we're able to do in primary care is stem the tide of it basically being just a punt for anybody who comes in with chronic pain to go to tertiary care. Because I would hope that we would want you all to focus on the patients that truly need to be at that level of care. Now it's like, I use this example all the time, it's like somebody coming into primary care with a headache. Well, we don't want the primary care provider punting to neurology every time somebody comes into a headache, and in for a headache, but if there are certain criteria that that patient meets, well, yeah, we probably want to get a more specialized referral. And so that's sort of an ongoing concern, and money is huge at this point. So I think, you know, some of the, the other clinical support services that you talked about, I think those are being discussed in the clinical support services community and the pain work groups that are happening at the DHA and the service level. If anybody wants, knows, is involved with that and wants to comment more, please do so. Did, did I mostly answer your question or did I whiff, whiff on it? No, so that's, that's helpful. Um, you know, it's just the step model of care starts with not treating the patient but educating and counseling the patient. I just, we're, I just don't know if there's a standardized thing that we're doing that patients should get. Patients should get this, this type of counseling of what chronic pain is at the medical home. Mm -hmm. this, this type of counseling of they need to be engaged in their care and they need to do rehabilitation as opposed to treatment and being fixed, getting that mindset started. And then, hey, maybe they need to have for the first, like the, the step model care then says, you know, physical therapy might be appropriate, the next, next model. Um, but I guess it's a, it's a work in progress, and we are seeing, seeing improvements, so. Right, I, th I think you're right. It's a work in progress. I think you make a good point. I think we've put together an algorithm that helps the primary care team think about that, and we've attempted, or we've given an initial um, shot at providing them with materials and how they think about and what patient goes to self-management, what patient do you bring the IBHC on, what patient do you initially want to go to PT as their first line, you know, what patient just doesn't do anything. They have, you know, ice compression and elevation on their, you know. Um, so do keep that in mind, and I think that's part of what we will be looking at. How many of these folks um, are staying in primary care, are getting services, and then what's the functional outcome? Because that's really, to me, at the end of the day, what it is. Um, I think we're always going to be want, wanting to look at how can we make it better, how can we improve it, and we have to start somewhere. And so I think we've got probably an 80% solution. But yeah, good point. If I may, uh, sorry about that. Sorry, I'm giving you my back, but I got to talk to the mic. So the, uh, to answer your question about the, uh, again, Mr. Moss, uh, OTSG Army Pain, uh, to give you the update, Army Family Action Plan 697 and 698, uh, is routing for a rule change in TRICARE to be a cover benefit. Uh, we're expecting the first quarter of 2021 that active duty members will be able to get chiropractic care and acupuncture care outside the walls of the MTF. So I hope that that addresses your question about the acupuncture and uh, chiro. And, and my hope is when, assuming that that policy gets in and is paid for, that we have some standardization so that we have quality control. Because that's always my fear when something goes outside of the MTF. I, I don't know what they're getting. No idea. But that is something that is being discussed on a regular, almost weekly basis at Medical Affairs. That roughly 60, I think it's roughly 60% of our services network, not direct care. What quality controls do we have over that? That's why I always wanted to 
keep the patients in the MTF, you know, because I, I know what's going on there. I, I can look at what's happening. I can, you know, if, if I can see the medical record and at least glean kind of what's happening out of that. Oh, wow. There's so many questions. I'm so glad I only took 25 minutes. Um, there was, I think, a question here and then one back here. Uh oh, I've done something. The teacher's coming. Oh, oh, vice principal in charge of discipline. Go ahead. I'll go first since I'm in the corner here. Uh, Jeff Tedi, I'm Jeff of Pain at Longstall. Um, so when we look at the stepped model of care, um, the elephant in the room is that most of the patients that require tertiary care, um, the etiology behind that, most of it is access to disorders or even um, secondary gain type issues, if that makes sense. That's the elephant in the room, right? And so you have to see a specialist to get an MRDP statement in the Army. And I was wondering if there's thought or a process to where we could screen out basically the soldiers that don't want to be soldiers um, so we don't waste precious resources, whether it be inside the MTF or sending them outside for never-ending chiropractic care for a soldier who is not going to be a functional soldier anyway. So you're saying this is complex? <laughs> I'm saying that we are wasting an unbelievable amount of money right now on very high expense, low quality care in a system where there's a secondary gain issue um, that politically is not being addressed. Right. So I know um, as of last week there were um, at the uh, Clinical Community Advisory Council, which is where all of the clinical communities meet, there was some discussion about how are we going to get better transparency so that, hey, no kidding, people are consistently put on a right profile, and if they're not better after X number of months, that they're either going to meet a med board or be discharged or whatever the right way happens to be. And I believe you were in that. And so I think, yeah, I mean, one, it's hard to diagnose a personality disorder. I mean, as a clinical psychologist, active duty military, I probably diagnosed maybe three on command-directed evaluations because I had enough data to do it. So I think at the end of the day, for me personally, for active duty, and I don't mean this to sound harsh, but it's going to, the military health system is not a rehabilitation system. I, it's we're going to give you the best care we can, whether that's direct care or network. We're going to try to get you well. And at some point, you're either well and you're fit for duty, or you need to be profiled and will be fit for duty doing something else, or you need to meet an MEV, right? How that works, I, I think you'd want to standardize it and have very specific tick marks. We, can, we, can we set up the electronic health record that automatically flags a certain cluster of appointments or behaviors or diagnostic categories. I, I agree with you. I mean, when I was active duty, I would see it at, at Lackland Air Force Base. That's where all the new recruits come in. And I'd see them come in, and they go to the behavioral analysis service. And it's like, wow. What we need to do is put the contingency on the recruiter so that they only get credit if somebody stays in at least a year, and then we're going to get different people coming in here. But that's that's a whole other that's a whole other line kind of issue. But yeah, um, but those are the kind of ideas and the information that we really need to hear up from boots on the ground folks at DHA because that's part of our mission. Part of the clinical community's mission is, and you will see this as we get closer to one October and as the different clinical communities stand up and become more robust. There's going to be dialogue back and forth. We need to know what you need us to do. And part of my job at DHA is to attempt to make that happen or to bring in my colleagues or my bosses to help make that happen. To follow up on that real quick, the, over here, Major Freeman, um, we reach those year-plus temporary profiles and we try to send them to IDES and they basically say you have not reached MRDP even though the standard is if they've been on profile for over a year they need to be sent through the MEB and they'll kick them back repeatedly without going to the tertiary specialists and that that needs to change 
Because if the regulation states a year not gotten better, then we need to evaluate and send them on their way. So not throwing any service under the bus, but it has been my experience while I have been at DHA that the services have at times decided they're going to do what they want to do. That it doesn't matter whether there's a DHA policy or a DOD instruction. And in fact, commanders will just kind of say, yeah, I know that's there. I'm going to do my own thing. I think that approach will be largely met with failure after 1 October because <laughs> the DHA is going to have authority, direction, and control. And so, hey, no kidding, that's why all these procedural instructions and the procedural manuals are coming out, and there's going to be monitoring with dashboards to make sure that things happen and people will be held accountable at the market and local level, or at least that's my understanding. And it's going to take time to change because there are going to be certain people who you know, always going to have laggards who are going to want to try to game the system or gum things up. Yeah, Captain Hunter, sorry if I, right. if I may add, the, uh, the integrated disability evaluation system will remain under the responsibility of the services. In this case, OTSG will remain the helms of readiness. And there will be a slightly difference across services because of the mission of, you know, land, air, and sea. So there's different components of that. But just two points that I want to mention that the challenge is that not that we're not blind when you look at the Stepker model. There's two main challenges when you look at that. One is that we don't have the capacity to implement the model as depicted because all the roads conduct to the third level of care, meaning IPMCs, and in the Army we got 12, the Navy got five. There's not enough. Uh, we shared the, the, the comment when we got the town hall. Uh, there's more to follow on that to see what venue we're going to do. And then the next comment I got is that if you look at the model, if we have implement the model as, as depicted, we're violating one of the core principles, which is prevent chronicity. Because we're saying you need to advance and get more complex. It's not from the beginning, from the acute phase, that you will be referred to the IPMC. Therefore, you have to be chronically ill. You have to be on opiates. You got to be really in bad shape and not be able to be fixed by the PCM to see the third level of care. But wait a minute. Didn't we say that part of the principle is to prevent chronicity? So again, there's some, there's some flaws. It's not perfect. So just to be mindful that those are the challenges that we're facing when we look at the step care model. Sorry, I got a little winded. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Passamani? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm going to make an argument here that you guys are looking at the wrong problem. Okay, I think that one of the problems is that currently we're doing a significant disservice to our service members. Okay, we have every single soldier. I work at the Warrior Clinic. Um, I've been working there now 11 years, and I'm 30 years in the Army, still in the Army. And uh, I can guarantee you, almost every single soldier that walks into my clinic has chronic knee and back pain. Almost, I would say 98 percent. So that tells me two things: one, we're not doing the right thing in the field. So you know, we ought to stop talking about kicking soldiers out when we're not doing the right thing to keep them in, one. Uh, two, I think our rehab system, and this is not on any of these people because we're doing the best we can in the system we can, but the system is not right. We need to be like exos, okay? I'm going to just give you a quick example. A patient had an IDO brace. He's been having knee pain for months and doing standard PT as best as PT can in an hour, okay? Then he goes to the Exo Center, they start teaching him all this stuff, and I know that the PTs would love to have something like that and be able to spend this time with soldiers. And I'm like, why aren't we doing this? Our frontline soldiers should get frontline care. They are like professional athletes. If we don't treat our infantry soldiers who are on the front lines, our special forces who are on the front line, like professional athletes, we are not doing our job. And then we're going to kick them out after a year of injuries? We're not doing right. We need to do better at doing this. And I'm going to give you an example of this is not a new thought. I was in, uh, in 2000 and maybe three or four, I was at Fort Stewart, and our orthopedic surgeon there wanted to do, he was doing more arthroscopies than the program that he was going to go train in, okay? Uh, wanted to do a rapid uh, PT program where, you know, they do surgery right away on these soldiers, get them in, do therapy, you know, in advance, basically get back to work program. Uh, you know, that was not adopted, okay? But that's the kind of thing that people have, I know in the field have thought about for many, many years, but we're not doing. So if we don't do that, we're not doing the right thing for our soldiers, okay? 
And I think we have to look at it from that standpoint. If we don't treat them like professional athletes, try to get them fixed and out and quickly and with lots and lots of really good evidence-based therapies, which are out there, but one you know, hour a, two or three times a week is not going to do it. Guarantee you any PT would love to have more time with their soldiers than that. Um, we're not going to... We're not going to do right for these soldiers. Anyway. Agree. I think if we can prevent injury, absolutely. And I think it's the statement that, that you have made. Those are the kind of quadruple aim performance plan things that we want folks at the MTFs to put in. We think we have a better way to do this. Here's how we think it, it, it should go. Here's our pilot data. We need money to do it because that's being looked at at the uh, DAD MA level. We saw all the markets QPP plans. They got sent to all the SMEs, and we read through them. And so we want to support, especially if they need funding. And so those are the kind of ideas that we absolutely want coming from you all. So just a follow-up on that, though. If PTs monitor just like the rest of us, and I'm not a PT, so I'm not going to speak for them, but if they're monitored the way we all are as primary care and, you know, and basically they're primary care for physical therapy, um, and it's all about the numbers game, no one's going to give them the time to say, oh, why don't you start this program up? We're going to take you out of the regular numbers count when you're already you know, low staff and can't even see who you got in the network. And uh, do this wonderful program for your soldiers, and let's try it out. Who's going to pay for that? Let's, the reality is no facility right now is going to sponsor that because they don't want to lose that provider to do that kind of research. I mean, anyone here, answer, if you're a PT, please tell me otherwise, but I don't think that's the case. My hope is that that will change and that funding will be provided at the market level for that to happen and access, I mean, if you're understaffed, again, we need to know about that. It, I mean, <laughs> hey, let's keep it. Let, <laughs> so keep in mind, keep in mind, currently you're understaffed. That, that, that's not, that wasn't DHA's call, right? So now's a chance for it to change, okay? Now I can't promise you that the money will happen because I can't make that call. But, yeah, I mean, do we, do we need to focus on access? Yes. Do we want to focus on RVUs? N no. And I know that's a big Army thing. That's, they're gonna, still going to have trouble dropping that. Um, but I, I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is I hear your frustration. I can see that you're really passionate about what you do and you want something to be different. And I would hope that you would be part of that agent of change moving forward. And I think we'll, we'll take maybe one more question, and then Dr. Hunter will um, be up here. Uh, everybody's pointing this way. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, William Lawrence, primary care pain champion at Fort Bragg. So just have one comment and then one question. Uh, the comment echoes what he said up front as far as family members and the stepped care model. So with the family members, we can basically get them a referral covered by TRICARE to pain management or to physical therapy. But none of the other ancillary services are covered under TRICARE for family members, so it makes it very difficult for the stepped care model. Uh, the question is, when this gets implemented, are commands going to be told to block off time so the average healthcare provider has time where they're trained on this, or is it just going to be an Outlook message with an attachment? Over. I can tell you how it's supposed to happen, and I can tell you we've gotten feedback from the field, is that the primary care pain champions are supposed to go back and train this in person with your entire clinic. I believe there's roughly, um, well, depending on who you include, there's roughly four hours of training that would happen face-to-face. Yeah, so at our clinic, we have no time blocked off for staff meetings. It's all just see patients, and that's all. And that's why a directive from Health Affairs, if they want this to actually be implemented, to commands where there is blocked off time so that the average provider can be educated would be beneficial. So the way that we've been handling that is that you as a pain champion get blowback from your command. You let Dr. Bell and I know, and I, we will write an email like we did the other day. Well, I see you shaking your head. You're saying it's not going to work. 
No, no, it's not going to work for the average provider because health affairs is saying you have to have all these access appointments per week, and that's what the command is being told. And they will not allow time to be blocked off to educate the average health care provider. So sometimes there's a miscommunication between what's in policy and what actually happens boots on the ground. If you're getting that blowback from your local command, contact me and Dr. Bell and we will work it out because this needs this is an, an outlook message. This needs to be face to face, real no kidding training because it's not going away. We're going to be pulling numbers on all the primary care clinics. And I, I get where you're coming from because I've excuse me. I've lived that in the past. And yeah, so primary care, you're supposed to have 100 available appointments based on the new DH API that's going to come out. If you're available for clinic, if you are taking time out for training, that doesn't matter. That doesn't count. Put it in your dimmer's eye, right? So it's accounted for. And we've been able to, at least so far, communicate effectively with local command to help them understand. You're shaking your head. You probably need to talk with me later, and we'll see what we can do with that. And with that, Chris, I want to thank you again. Really appreciate. <laughs> and again, this, this rounds out our plenary session for this year. I think we had a fantastic group of speakers, a diversity from neuroscience, clinical, policy, with our patient, um, a couple of announcements. I thanked everybody, but I forgot to thank each and every one of you because you all came and taken time away from your families, your clinics, and I really do appreciate that here. And as we build this community of practice, we're gonna be talking amongst ourselves, with each other, teaching each other all of these things, and I do appreciate that. So thank you all for coming. Uh, the bus will be here in 15 minutes. Remember, tomorrow the coffee shop and the hotel opens at 5 a.m. They're opening early for us, and the restaurant is going to open at 6 a.m. Again, they're opening early for us. So, And I do apologize for the little delay in the lunch, and I think we'll have that glitch worked out again tomorrow. So thank you all. Enjoy an evening, afternoon in Miami, and see you all tomorrow. Thank you.